Hi, this is David Shoemaker. Welcome to the second installment of the Living Thelema segment on the Speech in the Silence podcast. For those of you who might be listening for the first time, this segment, as I explained um, on the first segment, is going to cover uh, lots of practical details about the performance of various rituals and really dig into your day-to-day -day experience of mystical and magical practice. I want to thank everybody who took the time to send me emails or contact me on Facebook to give me your thoughts and suggestions and feedback on the first segment. One of the things that was most gratifying to me is the way that so many of you seem to be um, rethinking your practice of Libra Resch uh, based on the last segment. Now, I'm not saying I wanted everyone to change the way they practiced Libra Resch, but it was gratifying to see that this was making a practical difference for people. I had a couple people say they were re-energized in their practice of Libra Resch because they uh, were thinking about it in a new way or trying some of the uh, visualizations I'd recommended and that sort of thing. So thanks very much for listening and for your feedback. As I said in the first segment, we're going to begin with a lot of the fundamental practices of Thelemic magic and mysticism, practices that really form the foundation for all your work to come after. Much like Liberesh, one of the other fundamental practices that uh, many of you have, I'm sure, come across and, and many of you have practiced as well, is uh, the lesser ritual of the pentagram. And that's what today's segment's going to be talking about. But first, we're going to answer a few questions that have come to me through email um, since the first podcast. Uh, there were several questions that focused on the idea of customization of ritual. The question was, when is it appropriate to make your own innovations in, in a, a ritual such as Libra Resh or uh, the other fundamental rituals, when and where and how and why would one want to diverge from the um, from the traditional forms of these rituals and, and make it your own in, in some way? And the answer kind of depends on where you are in your training and what your current training goals are. For example, if you're a member of a magical order that is teaching a certain ritual a certain way, uh, then presumably what's happening there is that you've committed yourself to, to learn things a certain way, to develop a system that is internally consistent and matches the rest of the practices that you're going to encounter within that system. Any magical order worth its salt is going to have an internally consistent system of, of teaching. So um, if you're within an order, you probably want to practice it that way, at least learn it that way, do the uh, assigned practices as they're prescribed so that you can get the fundamentals down and, and make that system internally consistent for yourself. Now, later on, um, I think it's inevitable and, and highly desirable that you customize these rituals to fit your own growing understanding of yourself and your physical and mental and emotional and spiritual energies so that the rituals you do are not merely wrote recitation of some sort of traditional ritual, but have really incorporated everything you know about who you are and what your path in the world is, what your true will is. Of course, the ultimate example of this is in the build-up to your eventual working of the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. In the system of the AA, the various grade tasks leading up to this working, in whatever form it may eventually take, are going to be building within you the capacity to receive specific instructions for your angel on the construction of the angel's own invocation procedures, if you want to call them that. And so um, this process being so highly individualized and uh, intimate could hardly be written in any book by anyone else for you. Sure, tools can be given to you, but... Here's one example of where customization is the entire game. So thanks to those of you who wrote in with these questions, and uh, let's move on to talk about the Lesser Ritual of the Pentagram. Now, the ritual script for the Lesser Ritual of the Pentagram in both its banishing and invoking forms is readily available in many published sources. Probably the, um, the one you would have at hand most uh, readily is Libra O, which is also in Libra ABA, and that's a Crowley Libra, of course. 
And uh, I've also given a link to a online an online version of the ritual, um, which you can find in the podcast blog. So you're probably going to want to have some version of the ritual script in front of you as you listen to this podcast, um, because I may jump around from time to time in explaining the different components of the ritual. Much like I did with Liberesh, one of my goals here is to give you some clues as to how to really expand into the different sections of the ritual with your your intention, your consciousness, your visualization, so you can really maximize the impact of the ritual. Now, one of the questions that I suspect will come up as you listen, especially for those of you who've been around practicing Thelemic Magic for a while, is why am I working with the lesser ritual of the pentagram at all in its traditional form? Uh, after all, Crowley talked about the importance of new aeon forms of rituals and wrote uh, these sorts of revised rituals, such as the Star Ruby, uh, being an example of a revised ritual of the pentagram. And here's why I'm focusing on this. It was Crowley's basic point of reference as to the function of a pentagram ritual. He had learned this in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. He continued to teach it in its traditional form, more or less, to the end of his life. Uh, I never have seen anything in any of Crowley's diaries to indicate he actually practiced the Star Ruby himself or taught the Star Ruby to others. If any of you have actually seen some evidence of this, I'd be interested to know where it is. This is not to diminish the importance of the Star Ruby, which I think is a wonderful ritual, and in fact I'll do a segment on it. But what I'm trying to point out is that this is a traditional form of a pentagram ritual that Crowley evidently found extremely valuable throughout his life well after he had crafted the Star Ruby and other rituals. I think it's the most important starting place for any magical practice, quite frankly. Uh, Crowley was known to recommend performing it twice a day. Many others have recommended daily performance of this ritual. You'll find lots of magic books that start you out with this and... Uh, there's good reason. What is the effect of the ritual? Well, ultimately, you have to find that out for yourself through daily practice, diligent journaling, taking note of other factors which may be influencing the effect of the ritual. And just as Crowley always recommends, uh, we should take a scientific approach to our practice and our journaling so that we can leave behind a record that's intelligible to us as well as others. But the effects generally fall into a couple categories. First of all, the ritual tends to clear the psychological, magical, astral space of the magician. It is also an invocation of the four archangels traditionally attributed to the four elements and the four quarters. Many people use this ritual more or less as their daily magical hygiene ritual. It includes the cleansing effect uh, of the banishing form of the ritual, as well as the energizing effect of the invoking form. We'll talk a little bit more about those later. In addition to the hygienic function, the lesser ritual of the pentagram in its banishing form is very often used in different traditions to prepare the space for any elemental invocations. So you would perform the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram prior to beginning the formula of whatever elemental invocations you're using. I'll talk a lot more about this in a later segment covering ritual construction. But for now, what you need to know is that the LBRP is an effective beginning place for many ritual structures. Finally, there are a number of traditions that use the lesser ritual of the pentagram as a clearing of ritual space for any number of uh, types of group working. This will vary by tradition, of course. Now, one important thing to point out is that while the lesser ritual, the pentagram, traces the pentagram as if it is an elemental earth pentagram, the purpose, the intention of the lesser ritual of the pentagram is not necessarily specifically a banishing or invoking of earth as an element. The intention is more of what I was describing before, as a generic cleansing and space preparation. There would be differences in intention and in some performance details if you were doing a specific uh, earth invocation or banishing, and we'll go over those in a later segment. The specific form of the ritual I'm teaching here is uh, 
very similar to the way I learned it from my teacher, Phyllis Seckler, who was also known as Sora Merrill. She's our founding lodge master here at 418 Lodge. And uh, she had learned it at Agape Lodge in the late 1930s and early 1940s from Jane Wolfe and others. Jane Wolfe, of course, had studied with Crowley at Chefalu uh, at the Abbey of Philema. So um, this ritual, as I'm going to present it, varies slightly from what you will find in Liber O, but it is uh, similar to the way various traditions have been teaching it in, in modern times and incorporates some of Crowley's own uh, elaborations in the years following when he actually wrote Liber O. So let's begin going through the ritual. You should begin, as with many rituals, uh, by relaxing, sitting in a balanced posture, doing some rhythmic breathing, getting yourself physically relaxed for everything that is to come. When you're ready to begin the ritual, you should move to the center of the room where you may have an altar set up. Um, you can use any Gaboran related weapon, such as a Gaboran dagger or a magic sword, which corresponds to Gabora. You can use your favorite wand or just use your finger. The ritual begins with a segment known as the Kabbalistic Cross. This is the section you'll see in the ritual script that begins with touching the forehead and saying Atta and concluding with uh, Leolam Amen. Now this section is one of the areas where Crowley's practice um, developed considerably after Libra O was written. In later years, he began teaching that you touch the forehead and say Atta, you touch the heart and you vibrate Iwas. Then touching the genitals, say Malkuth. Now, this is also the way that uh, Phyllis Seckler learned it in uh, the 30s and 40s down in Agape Lodge, uh, even though there is some evidence that Crowley stopped teaching it that way toward the end of his life. Um, this is the way I've always learned it and taught it. And one of the advantages here is that since you are intoning Iwas at the heart, every time you perform this ritual, you are linking yourself to the energies of the aeon itself. Um, many people have over the years objected that uh, Iwas was Crowley's holy guardian angel, so why would we want to name someone else's holy guardian angel in our rituals? And while I think that's a pretty reasonable objection under most circumstances, I think uh, there's the, that tiny detail of Iwas being the voice of the Aeon itself. So I don't feel too uncomfortable uh, recommending people use Iwas at their heart. Now, when you learn the name of your angel, which may happen a long time before you actually do a formal knowledge of conversation working, that's very often been the case, um, then you replace Iwas with the name of your own angel when touching the heart in the pentagram ritual. Now, the key to the successful performance of the Kabbalistic cross, in my experience, is a certain quiet intensity of vibration and energy flow at each of the points that you're touching. You should simultaneously be feeling the light, the energy moving as you move from point to point during this Kabbalistic cross. Um, and each time you vibrate, you should be feeling the energy intensify at the point of the body where you're touching, but also, as with any vibration, you are feeling as though the word you are saying is echoing to the far reaches of the universe, that the entire universe is literally vibrating with you and as a consequence of the execution of, of your will and your pronouncing of these words. So you're standing at the center of your temple, perhaps on the western side of your altar facing east, and you perform the Kabbalistic cross, which altogether would sound like this. Ata I was Malkut Vigidura Vigidula 
Now, each of those words should be vibrated fully on a full exhalation. In other words, you take a, a full in-breath, and then on the full exhalation, the, the word is vibrated with approximately equal time and emphasis on each letter of the word. The last syllable will uh, sometimes be elongated if possible. If it's uh, Lamed, you may have trouble... Uh, carrying an L sound out that long, and that sounds a little bit silly, but in general, you, uh, you're you going to spend about equal time on each syllable. Now, Crowley does a pretty nice job of describing the process of vibration of God names in another section of Libra O, so I'd refer you to that for the full directions there. So you've performed the Kabbalistic cross at the center of the temple. You then move to the east, and you draw your first pentagram. Now, of course, the banishing form of the pentagram begins at the lower left point and moves up to the top as the first stroke. You'll see these forms of drawing the pentagrams uh, in a lots of the published versions. I'd suggest that you aim roughly for about hip level for the lower points of the pentagram and roughly shoulder level for the, uh, not the top point, but for the uh, the upper two points there. This is probably one of the least awkward ways of tracing it where the movements are more or less natural um, with the reach of your arm and so on. We'll use the banishing form of the ritual for this example. So in the east you're drawing your first pentagram and the god name attributed to this quarter is yod He vav He. Now in places including in Crowley's Libra O you'll see um, attempts at telling you how to pronounce this. I have just never been satisfied with the the various ways that people try to actually pronounce this, and therefore I teach it with the four letters simply being vibrated as letters. So you're actually going to vibrate yod he vav he. So you draw the pentagram, point your wand or finger or dagger or sword to the center of the pentagram, vibrate the name yod he vav he, and in some traditions, you retire in the sign of silence. In other traditions, you simply leave the sword or finger extended, and then you draw the connecting circle to the next quarter. The pentagrams and the connecting circles are often drawn in sort of a blue-white flame. This is a pretty traditional way of teaching how to visualize what you're drawing. Uh, if you have learned a different tradition, by all means use it. So the connecting line is drawn to the south, where you draw the next pentagram, point to the center, and vibrate Adonai. Connecting line is drawn to the west, where you draw the next pentagram and vibrate Eheye. The connecting line is drawn to the north, where you draw the final pentagram and vibrate Ata Gibor Leolam Adonai. Now this is often given just by its initials Agla, we know what the phrase is, and I feel that it makes sense to actually vibrate the phrase we're, we're meaning to imply rather than just initials. So um, that's the way I teach it with the full phrase there. So those four divine names sound like this. yod he vav he After the fourth pentagram is drawn in the north, you draw the connecting line back to the east, uh, taking special care to connect the line to its starting place. Then you return to the west side of your altar facing east, or just to the center of the temple, for the next section. Here is where you're going to invoke and visualize the four great archangels who, by tradition, are assigned to the protection of humanity and assigned, attributed to the 
four elements in the four quarters. The names are Raphael in the east, Gavriel in the west, Mikael in the south, and Uriel in the north. With each of these names, you're standing in the form of a cross and facing east. With each of these names, you're going to be visualizing the archangel as a towering figure of great power, robed in the appropriate elemental color. That is yellow for east, blue for west, red for south, black or possibly green for north. Often these are visualized with outstretched white wings and your classical uh, image of, of an archangel. Now here's another one of those moments where you can really amplify the effect of the ritual tremendously by your inner work that you do, your visualizations. With each of these archangels, you have the opportunity to really emphasize the presence of the element in question in your spiritual makeup. So when you're invoking Raphael, you're not only seeing this great archangelic being robed in yellow, uh, you're, you're experiencing the element of air itself as it manifests in you. You might amplify this by feeling a great uh, cleansing wind from the east. And when you invoke Gabriel in the west, you can feel a wave of blue water purifying you a consecrating fire from Mikael in the south and a preserving solidity and groundedness from Uriel in the north. So, you know, amplify this, elaborate this, customize this part of it however you like. This is definitely one of those places where your own experience is going to teach you how to get the most out of these rituals and these parts of these rituals. After the four archangels are invoked, you are still standing in the form of a cross and you say the words, for about me flames the pentagram. And at this point, you can see the points of the pentagram actually surrounding your body. So you're standing essentially as the, the perfected microcosm pentagram. But I also understand and experience that point in the ritual to be um, a statement of the truth that all that we see around us, all that we experience in our lives is truly the pentagram of life flaming around us. And then the next line is, and in the column shines the six-rayed star. Here I like to visualize a hexagram at the heart and emphasize it in my mind and visualization as the real secret spiritual seed within the light of the angel burning in my heart and that sort of idea. Here's another place where you'll need to fill in your own gaps and work with your own experience and knowledge of yourself to develop the best way to feel through this. But those are some suggestions. And then at this point, you put your arms down and repeat the formula of the Kabbalistic cross through to the end. And that concludes the ritual. Now, let me give you some performance suggestions here. As I said earlier, Crowley was known to recommend twice-day performance, and other teachers have done the same. I'd say at least once daily is what you're shooting for. Now, there's the invoking form, too, and um, I think there's a lot of emphasis on banishing form as a daily ritual, but there's a lot to be gained by performing that invoking form of the ritual every day as well. So if you're doing twice-a-day performance, you might consider doing one of them as a banishing and one of them as an invoking. If you try that, my personal practice and experience and the students I've supervised have verified this in their experience, that uh, often it is a little bit difficult to sleep if you do the invoking form late in the evening. It's an energizing ritual, and something gets stirred up that doesn't want to quiet down too much when it's bedtime. So you might experiment with doing the invoking form of the pentagram ritual in the early part of the day and then do the banishing form in the evening. Now, the same considerations that I discussed concerning privacy in the Liberesh segment apply here. If you need to be quiet when you do the ritual, then it's perfectly acceptable, probably not as preferable as, as vibrating it out loud, but it's perfectly acceptable to 
whisper it or do it silently. Furthermore, here's another example of a ritual that is probably useful to practice in its astral form. To carry yourself astrally or as you're practicing, at least mentally, through the practice of the ritual is going to strengthen those muscles of visualization and in theory is also strengthening your astral body's ability to perform this ritual in its own plane. Um, and that, and that's going to be very handy when you maybe are doing some scrying and you need to, uh, banish some sort of energy or entity that you've encountered. So that about covers it in terms of the performance of the ritual and some of the details of making the most of it. And I hope that's been useful for you to consider and compare to your own practice and maybe revisit uh, ways that you might want to practice the ritual. Now, as always, I would welcome your feedback, comments, questions about anything that I've talked about today or in previous segments. I'd like to let everybody know that I do have a new webpage devoted to Living Thelema at livingthelema.com. And my contact email is on there. It's livingthelema at me.com. Also, I've set up a new Facebook page for Living Thelema. So if you enjoy the segment, please consider becoming a fan of that, and you'll get announcements and other updates through Facebook. My plan for the website is eventually to offer links and other resources that may augment the information I provide on the podcast, and uh, that site will be gradually built over time. For now, you can use that to retrieve my contact email if you want to ask any questions. Now, because of the volume of emails that I'm receiving, I may not be able to answer each question directly and individually in terms of an email response, but I will do my very best to make sure that any questions I do receive get answered on a segment in the future. And what I'll try to do is answer the questions during the segment that is most closely going to connect with the substance of the question. For example, I received a question on asana in the last couple weeks, and when I do the segment on asana, I'll try to answer that question at that time. So thanks very much for listening to this second segment of Living Thelema, and I hope you also enjoy the rest of the Speech in the Silence podcast. I think they're doing a great job of putting these together. I look forward to talking to you next time.